Hello, my name is Lam Fan, and I'm the author of Do This Daily. I'm also the CEO of Community of Seven. So on my episode for Business Growth Architect Show, I'll be sharing how you can find your purpose and more importantly, how you can live it. I'll be wa- walking you through my experience building Community of Seven from getting laid off from my corporate job at Fortune Magazine to building a global brand that impacts millions with my goal of democratizing training and development for all and impacting millions of lives along the way. Hope to see you on the other side. And hello, fabulous person, Beate Gillette here. I am the host of the Business Growth Architect Show, and I want to welcome you to today's episode where we discuss how to navigate strategy and spirituality to achieve time and financial freedom. Truly successful people have learned how to master both a clear intention and a strategy to execute that in a spiritual practice that will help them to stay in alignment and on purpose. Please enjoy the show and listen to what our guest today has to say about this very topic. Welcome back. Your host, Beate Schlett, here today. We're talking to Lan Fan, and today we're going to have a conversation about purpose, which I think is super, super meaningful, especially in times like today, where everybody's trying to figure out what did I come here for. Lan, I'm excited to have you on the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Beate. I'm so excited for this call. Same here. So for somebody who doesn't know who you are, will you tell us a little bit about who you are and what problems are you solving for your clients? Definitely. So I'm the author of Do This Daily, but I'm also the CEO and founder of Community of Seven. And my company's goal is really how do we democratize training and development for all and move from focusing on systemic inequities to creating systemic equality? So one one part about your story that I that really deeply resonated with me was when you had this powerful job at this big company that you must tell us about. And then there was this pivotal moment where you asked yourself a specific question. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened? No, definitely. So just a little bit of background. Like prior to this, I was on the executive track for decades. I was like C-suite executive. I was kind of climbing the corporate ladder working with a lot of exec- like C-suite executives was kind of like my, um, I guess, expertise. So I was a serial entrepreneur building startups within companies. So in 2019, I thought I found what... Uh, so so in 2019, I found what I thought was my dream job. I was recruited by Alan Murray of Fortune Magazine to build a startup within Fortune. Um, I was given a multi-million dollar budget and my, I guess, task was to build a startup from nuts to bolts, you know, basically build it from scratch within six months. I was supposed to team up, build a team of 100, and I got to hire number two, and I got laid off due to the pandemic. And what's worse was I had to lay off my entire team. And so I did a lot of soul searching at that time because, it, you know, the middle of the pandemic, I fell into this deep depression. I think the question I asked myself was, who am I without this job? And didn't get out of bed, was in my sweatpants and sweatshirt for like over a week, two weeks, didn't shower. And, you know, during this time, too, I just was so immersed in fear, which many of us were during the pandemic. My husband had also lost his job during the pandemic as well. So there was all this fear that was just kind of pulsating through my mind and my body. You know, are we going to make it through the pandemic? How are we going to pay for our mortgage. I also supported my mom who has advanced stage dementia at this time. And it was just really a lot of fear, a lot of depression, a lot of sadness. And it was finally my daughter who, you know, put her hands in my shoulder one day and just kind of woke me up. She was in kindergarten at that time. And she was like, mommy, I love you even without a job. And that was kind of my wake up call because I realized that I was just focusing so much on what I didn't have what I had lost, my identity. And I realized that the job didn't define who I was. And it's embarrassing to look back and and think of it now, but I was a 45-year-old woman who never asked myself what mattered most to me because I was defining my happiness, my success, based on other people's criteria, how much money I made, you know, what was in my bank account, 
what car I drove or what job I had. Did I have like this or the corner office, like all these superficial marker of success that really wasn't about me. And so I really focused on creating this journey of finding me. And it was during this time, I remember I had hired up to hire number five and I called my team and I was like, look, we're going to move our mission from building a startup to helping you find your next job. And I said, I will either build my business and hire you back or I will help you find your next job. And we ended up meeting over Zoom. This is the beginning of the pandemic weekly and to just really focus on, okay, what do you need? What kind of resources do you need? How can you, can I help? So there's five of them, me, so that's six. And my daughter, Morgan, who was in kindergarten at that time would join us. So that was the original community of seven. And that's how the name of my current company came about. I didn't know what I was starting at that time, but the name Community of Seven, that was the original name for Community of Seven. And then later down the line, what I would tell clients is that seven is the ideal number for meetings. And if you add every person you add beyond that seven, you will lose productivity by 10%. But then internally for me, seven is also has a lot of meaning because it is a number of completion. And my faith is something that's very important to me. And so seven had my own personal, I guess, important. A power, powerful story. So the, the question that I have to ask is, how do you get out of this intensity of the world coming down on top of you, right? So, I'm, I mean, you, you told the story. I'm in my pajamas. I can't even get up. How do you, is there a learning you can help? There has to be a, a point of button something that happened? Was it just the hand of your daughter? Or was there another process in there? I will be completely honest. And it was when I, and this might sound trite, but this is honestly how I got out of it. It's when I stopped focusing on my fears and what I lost. And I focused on how I could be of service to others. And I started focusing on how can I help those that are kind of hurting at that time. And so when I moved it, and also my family, focus on my ma- my family and also my daughter and what they needed from me, right? Because I was so focusing on what I had lost. But when you focus, when you turn the shift of how you view the world from your internal struggles to focusing on how you could be of service in the world, how you can help others, that's when, for me personally, I was able to see, have clarity in terms of what my purpose and my journey would be moving forward. And just every day I would just be, how can I help someone? And that for me was what got me out of my, and I, I've had a recurring history of depression in the past. And usually when you are in this deep hole and you're trying to climb out, when we go back in and we look downward and we look in here, that's when we sometimes fall deeper. But if we look and you climb above and you're looking at the people out there who want to help you, the people who you want to help and be of service, that's how you get out of that hole. That's so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. I can feel the emotion when you talk about it. Well, this is the principle of gratitude. That's what everybody always says. It's like, well, focus on the stuff that is happening already, that is happening for you instead of putting all your energy on creating more of the same scarcity you already have. From my personal experience, and I'm, I'm I'm equally transparent, I find this very difficult until I figured out that there was a concept in the law of attraction that is relating to this energetic vibration. And it, it talks about how you put yourself in this vibration of feeling good. And for me, that got exponentially easier when my daughter had her own daughter, when my grandchild was born. <laughs> So when, when I have these moments of despair or there's a cash flow crunch or something's happening, all I have to do is think about being with her or my playtime with her. And I'm immediately in this in this moment of gratitude. How would you tell others, you know, maybe is an example you can share on how you shift into that when, because these moments never go away. These moments always come in life. Oh. I mean, that is life after all. But what do you do? Is there a spiritual practice on how you catch yourself and shift it? Yeah, I often think of the adage, you know, life doesn't get easier, but we get stronger. Mm-hmm. And I think it's that constant reminder. And one of the things I always say to my friends and just people in general is that negative emotions aren't something you should be afraid of. 
They're there to kind of, my friend has a good way to put it. They're kind of guideposts guiding you, right? So whenever you feel fear or anger, there's a reason that it's trying to, your body is trying to tell you something, right? However, negative emotions are like a tunnel. You're meant to go through them, but you're never meant to live in them. You're always meant to move towards the light. For me, light is other people. Light is my faith, my belief and trust in God. It is just my belief that it is our duty in this world to make this world a, a better place for our children. And so when you focus on the light, it's much hard to stay in the darkness. And I think that is some days are easier said than the other. And it's you have to give yourself grace when there's days when you don't want to get out of bed. But then, you know, for me, it wasn't a huge shift. It was my daughter telling me how much she loved me that got me out of my stupor. But it was me getting out of bed, washing my face, combing my hair, doing my laundry, cleaning my house, making my bed. And I did what I could that day. And then I kept on moving. From there, I woke up one day and say this name community of seven came in my head and that night I was watching tv and I was with my husband and I just built a website the community of seven and I was like I don't know what I'm creating right now but I'm moving towards progress and I think when you get into that pit of despair or your sadness or you're just like I'm stuck just you know to quote Lao Tzu a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step just keep on taking one step, one step. You do the next right thing and you just keep on moving forward. I think we make transformation so complicated. But there's really only two ways to transform your life. Only two ways. It's really, it's easy, but it's not simple. It's what you add in your life and it's what you take away. What you add and what you take away. So if you are in a situation where you feel like overwhelmed, where you don't feel like you have a support in your community, maybe it's taking away negative people and adding friendships and connections that nurture you. If it's unhealthy eating, taking away maybe alcohol or cigarettes or, you know, the foods that are greasy and then adding in vegetables or fruits, water. And we make those small decisions. And that's why I have my book, and why it's called Do This Daily, transformation, people want it to happen overnight. But usually change happens by these small decisions we make each day. And we have to really understand who is the person we want to be and what are the actions I need to do daily to get there. Because if I want to be an athlete, then it's going to impact the friends and my connection that I make, right? It's going to impact what I eat, how I sleep, how I treat my body, what I read, what I do. And so it's a small decision each day. Okay, instead of just sitting on my couch all day, I'm going to go take a bike ride. And it's as simple as that, but it's not necessarily easy because what we want is safety. So we are ingrained with our, our unconscious bias rules, our decision making and how we act and behave. And our body is programmed with a negativity bias. Because our body wants to keep us safe, right? So when our ancestors were being chased by saber-toothed tigers, or we needed to decide whether this berry was poisonous or not, we erred on the side of fear because fear kept us safe. That might work if you're being chased by saber-toothed tigers. But now that we're in front of a desk, we're entrepreneurs, we're building businesses, we need to take more risks. So if you kind of look at the growth zone, right? There's a comfort zone. And then there's the learning zone. And then you have the growth zone. And like in between those are, is also the fear zone. So once you move into the learning zone and the growth zone, you're going to go past the fear zone, right? And so the only way we get past that is by doing, is by action. It's by doing the things we need to do daily. And, you know, not focusing on the status quo or the fear or staying complacent, but just kind of moving in the direction of where we want to be in our lives. This is so unbelievably powerful. I, th I think we've covered so many of these spiritual concepts of really being in charge of your own agency and making decisions consciously and then following through with these decisions. And I think sometimes people get really stuck 
in thinking that there is one main move, but there is not one main move. There is thousands of small steps, right? Yeah. Um, I want to shift gears now a little bit over to sort of the strategic part of it, because you obviously run a business and you are a for-profit business. And so talk to us about the community of seven and how does do this daily, how does this sort of all fit in? Because I think people sometimes have a hard time figuring out, does spirituality and strategy even connect? And this has been the purpose, my vision for this show is to say they're intricately Connect it. You need one to kind of do the other. Would you mind sharing a little bit about your path and how you combine the two of them? Definitely. Before I do, though, let me. In- I'm sure your listeners understand and have heard about ikigai, which is a Japanese concept of how your reason for being. How do you find your reason for being? And there's, you know, if you've seen the graphic, it's basically ikigai is in the middle, your reason for being, and the f- there's four concentric circles that overlap. And it is what you love, what you're good at. But here's an important part, right? It's also about what the world needs and what you can get paid for. So your goal is to find that where every four, those four points meet in the middle. And I think the problem with some people who are unhappy, me including, included, was in the beginning, I focused just on the last two quadrants of what, how can I can, you know, does a word need, world need it? And can, can I get paid for it? Probably more leaning towards the can I get paid for it? That was my co- tr- career trajectory for two decades, right? And then I realized that even though I had the pay, I had the title, the status, I was miserable inside. I wasn't taking care of my health. I said my family was my number one priority, but I would only see my daughters on the weekend because I was working from six o'clock at night to 10 o'clock at night. And I was traveling 85% of the time. I was diagnosed with pre-diabetes, right? So I was slowly killing myself, Mm -hmm. right? Not sleeping, sleeping maybe four or five hours a night. Oh, crazy. And so there was a disconnect, right? And so, but the problem too is that some people just focus on what they love or they're passionate about. If I was passionate about singing and I wanted to make that my pursuit, I would not be able to make a living because my singing is just not the thing, right? <laughs> There's a reality of also, you also need to be compensated for what you do because you have a mortgage to pay. If the people, if, you know, your family is important to, to you, you need to pay for school, you need to pay for supplies, all these other things. So I, what I love about the whole guy concept is you have to understand it's about what you love, what you're good at, um, what the world will pay for you, pay for, and what the world needs. And so for me, when I was first starting off, I it, and you're talking to someone who has been asking, what am I passionate about for all my life? And I always say that I'm a late bloomer because what I, you know, I'm going to turn 50 this year and I always tell people, you know, I... I'm going to turn 50 and I just figured out what I want to do when I grow up. And what I want to reiterate to people is it's not too late to figure it out. But you have to ask those questions. I wish I had asked these questions earlier, but I don't know if I would have been in the right place or I needed to make those stumbles and missteps in order to get me to where I am today. So Community of Seven, when it first started, I focused really on creating mastermind groups with CEOs and executives, very powerful people, and they paid thousands of dollars to join these masterminds. And it was successful, and I recruited a lot of people. But there was a tail end where I just started feeling trapped, and I just was like, I realized that it wasn't my passion to make really successful people more successful in the pursuit of making money and building a business. So I pivoted. I think after year two, year and a half, you know, one and a half, I started doing training and development for corporations, and I've had contracts now for the past four years for a lot of companies, working with big Fortune 100 companies, but also small startups as well. And my key is doing mass training for 100, 200, 300 people on a call. I've done as high as like, I think a thousand. And what's powerful about it is that usually the group training model, you have six or seven in a room and um, you go through this training for six hours and then nothing really sticks. And what I realized going through corporate America is that if you want to really change the culture of a company, you need to change the vocabulary and you need to get everyone swimming in the same direction. 
So, you know, I might have a startup that has 400 people in their company. I will say, okay, I need to do a training with the CEO, but also the office managers and the EAs and everybody on that call. And so that has been my focus probably for the past few years is really focusing on democratizing training and development for all. Because I know for me, it wasn't until I was age 40 that I got leadership development training, executive training, which is a shame because I think about the hundreds of people I've managed, but I wasn't deemed good enough to get training and development because it's so expensive until I was in my, my early 40s, right? So my goal is how do you create systemic equality through training and development? And so now I do, especially with do this daily out, I've been doing a lot of speaking globally. I just spoke in Saudi Arabia, London, France, and I speak all over the U.S. too. And I realized that by testing and learning that that's a passion. And it used to be the biggest, my biggest fear was public speaking. But I realized that when I'm on stage, I feel that connection with people. And it's almost like this dance. And so for me, I found this passion when it used to be something that scared me so much, right? So now my most of my business is centered around training and development, creating content, and also under keynote speaking, just all globally. That's wonderful. So you've really had this spiritual awakening after a complete dismantling or the breakdown. And so there was a breakdown, the breakthrough, and then the breakout. Yeah. And you were able to conquer your fears and you were very strategic about it because you were looking at the things that you knew and then you added the elements that you had discovered, the spiritual and the and the and the purpose purpose driven piece. Very, very powerful. So how can our audience find out more about you? Obviously we want everybody to buy your book. So so tell us a little bit about the book. Yeah. So um do this daily without now. <laughs> And you could buy it anywhere books are sold, Barnes and Nobles, Target, Amazon, et cetera. But the book kind of really goes over. So when I was working with those CEOs and founders, I the masterminds, we would go through this one year program. And it was really focused on how do you find your purpose and your reason for being, but more importantly, how do you actually live it? Right. Because I think that is maybe the pitfall of some of this abundance kind of learning, a law of attraction thing, you know, philosophy. And why people get stuck is that they think that if they visualize and believe it's going to happen, but you also have to do. The action, yeah. you have to, the action is just as probably just important, if it not more important. And people forget that piece. So what I really focus on is there's four chapters. The first part is really about intentionality, right? I use the analogy of a GPS. If you have a GPS, but you don't have an address, that GPS is worthless. You might get to where you need to go by luck but you're probably going to run over a cliff, have to U-turn or go the wrong way for a few miles, right? And so in life, that address is intentionality. So asking yourself, what matters most to me? What do I value for me most? For me, what mattered most was my family and my friends who are my chosen family, my faith, being of service to others and freedom. What I realized when I was doing this exercise is none of the jobs I had prior fulfilled any of them <laughs> like you need to build a life and the big difference was before I would find a job that paid well that had the status and then I would try to build what I loved and my life around it and what inevitably happened is that job would push everything out so what I've done differently now is I've built the life I want to live and what values most to me and then I've built a career around it and that's a fundamental difference so with do this daily the first part is what matters most to you the second part really delves into your mindset. So your mindset creates your destiny. And I always think about the Henry Ford quote, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And it's really our belief system that shape, you know, whether we think we can, like whether we have grit, whether we have resiliency, whether we have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset, right? And so a lot of it is just kind of dealing with how you see the world. The third part is really about change requires consistent action. It's about what we do daily. It's a habit. Like every day we are voting to be the person who we want through our actions. And it's our habit. It's our mindset. All this other stuff kind of combined. And the last part of my book is really about the art of changing. And that's really tying back to the what would we add and what, what we, do we delete? Because who we become is just as much about what we let go. And that's a part that sometimes people are, the reason why people don't transform 
is they still hold on to the past, the old stuff, yeah. who they are. They're old. Like, let's say, you know, I always think about, you know, the quote, Jim Rohn, we are the average of the five people we spend the most time with, right? So there were studies that were done where, you know, drug addicts and alcoholics would like be 90% more likely to lapse if they went back to their original surroundings, their old friend networks, their same neighborhood. And the people who succeeded were the ones who leaned into Alcoholics Anonymous, moved to a completely different environment, right? So the art of changing is really about chiseling away what we are not to become the people that we aspire to be. Mm -hmm. That is really the art of becoming. It's really these four things. What I'm asked a lot on these kind of podcasts or interviews is what makes your book different. And I'm very honest with people. You know all of this, right? All of these concepts in any self-help industry, we're all talking about the same. It's all out there. There's not brain surgery, right? There's no secret here. No. Because so Tony Robbins was Jim Rohn. Jim Rohn, there is the Bible. There is the Stoics. It's, you know, you go way back It Lao Tzu. Then you go back there. The first self-help book was really in Egypt, a son to his, a, da- a father to his son, right? What we're doing is trying to package this information so it connects with the people who are reading this. And for me, what makes mine, I guess, different is that my goal is to for it actually to be utilized. So it's not just shelf help, that actually people read it. And so I created the book. You read two pages, three pages, because people are really busy. You do a journal activity, and that's it. It takes five minutes at the most, right before you go to bed. And I wanted to write a book that actually would change people's lives. And the first thing you need to do is actually open it up and read it. Well, and to your point, I think that the mindset really has to be you want to find something that works for you. So there, there's certain, you know, like sometimes there's a, you know, I, I subscribe to this meditation app called Calm. There's one meditation teacher. I can't stand her voice. I just. <laughs> I think I know who you're talking about. <laughs> and, 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 and as judgmental as that is, but every time I go into meditation, I hear that voice. I immediately have this, this, this. This intense aversion, and and I totally get it. And I'm totally not fighting it. it, right? But there's this other guy who I love because he's quirky. I think his name is Jeff, and he's got some sort of this like really sort of unique spin on things, and I find that very interesting. The objective is for me to meditate, you know, whatever ten ten minutes a day. The objective is not, oh my god, why am I so judgmental with this one person? Who cares? So it doesn't matter what book you read. It doesn't matter if this is. If these five minutes and the two pages and the little journaling at the end of the day is doable for you, then figure out if it is and then just go ahead and, and, and do it. And if it's something else, do something else. And I think that's where a lot of us who are in this in this field are all the same. It's like, we're just giving you reiterations. Exactly. Based on the experience that we had when we had to put some a little bit of a spin on something to say, well, when we did that little thing, that worked for us. And that's you know what? hope. You know what it is? They're universal truth. Yes. Right? And so the thing with universal truth is you don't innovate them. You just basically you channel them. Yes. Channel them. And and I think also I'm a firm believer that we're all teachers and learners, right? Students. And so to be good at teacher, you need to be a good learner, a good student. To be a good student, it's helpful if you teach. And so I think When I see myself, I'm not a guru. I'm not someone to be followed. I'm a teacher, right? And so I've learned from other people. I've learned from a lot of mistakes, right? And my goal is for someone to not wait till they're turning 50 to figure out what they want to do. Have it a lot earlier because then you can have more time doing the things you love. Right. And the, thing, and the thing that you that you think you're doing now may not be the thing that you do when you're 60 no, and you may have the no. same thing all over again. And I know people that are still starting businesses at 68, 70, because they're just it, it's just not a, a reality that's appropriate for them. They don't buy into this uh, selling everything, buying an RV and driving through, through through America or something like that. Go ahead, please. What I've been doing is dividing my life into four quarters, right? So the average person lives 77 years. So that breaks down to 19.25 per year. Your first quarter is really learning how to walk, learning how to talk, learning how to be human, right? Like you're in school, right? 
The second quarter is about hustle mode, making money, um, really kind of climbing the corporate ladder. The third quarter is about really finding your meaning and your reason for being. And the last quarter is really about what is my legacy. And the reason why it's important, and here's the thing, it's not necessarily by age, because some people are much more wiser in their 20s than I was, right? But you have to kind of see things in stages. When I was in my 20s, the only thing I wanted to do was make money. Uh And the reason why was I didn't want to be broke, right? And, and you, you wanted had, to be independent and you wanted, wanted to, exactly. to prove everybody that you had it had it figured out. But then if you look at Maslow's kind of pyramid, the bottom is security. Like you can't get into enlightenment and self-realization if you don't have a home, if you don't have financial security. And so where you are in your second quarter is going to have a very different mindset. I think now being in the third quarter of, and I think a lot of the people I talk to, especially on LinkedIn, because I post daily, that message resonates with them because they're in that period of their life where they're trying to figure out, okay, I've I've done the corporate ladder now. What's my meaning? Right. Most of us don't ask that question. We look back and we wonder, you know, where did my life go? Well, we're asking our question. We're asking this question right now. And it's been a really powerful interview. Thank you so much, Lan, for sharing these very vulnerable and honest moments of how you, how you got to be who you are today. So for everybody, please uh, check out uh, the website. Everything is going to be in the show notes and uh, go get the book. Check her out. Len, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Beate. This was a wonderful conversation. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. And that is it for us for today. Thank you so much, as always, for listening to or watching this episode of the Business Growth Architect Show on spirituality and strategy. If you know somebody who is seeking purpose, please do us a favor and share this interview with this person today. And until next time and goodbye. So appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for listening to the entire episode. Please subscribe to the podcast. Give us a five-star review, a comment, and share this episode with one more person so that you can help us help more people. Thank you again. Until next time. Goodbye.